Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, let's see. Quinlan, hmm? you just need to turn it in. Yeah, okay. All right. Gwendolyn, okay. Hey, Gwendolyn, you want to read the scripture for me? Okay, find some scripture read. Reverend Banks, you want to pray us in? Yeah, I did. 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 I Good evening, everybody. Good evening. God is good, isn't he? Yes, he is. Oh, man. Gusta is here. Now we can get started, man. Gusta just walked in the door, so I know we can get started. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. Come on. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you stand with me and help me sing? Amen. I need thee. Oh, I need thee every hour. I tonight need you yes and we always need you mm. we certainly can't get along without you that's right and you've been good yes you've been good you've been mm. good and you're good right now yes we pray tonight for each and every one that's represented here tonight mm. we pray that we'll be better when we leave and when thank we came lord. thank you lord in the name of Jesus, yes. we pray for the teacher tonight. Thank you, Jesus. That all of us will learn something. Mm. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We can't make this journey by ourselves. That's right. Lord, we need you every step of the way. Mm. We need you every minute, every second, every hour. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, how we thank you. Thank you, Lord. We come lifting up our pastor tonight. Yes. Bless in the Lord name God. of Jesus. Bless him, Lord. Lord, God. we don't know, but you know. Yes, you do. And we know there's nothing too hard for you. Mm, nothing. And we know it's going to be all right. Yes. And it's all right right now. Yes. You said you'll never leave us. Mm. You'll never forsake us. That's right. In the name of Jesus. Mm. Oh, how we love you tonight. Amen. And we lift up this teacher tonight. Thank you. That he will, and yes. we know he will, mm. teach you something good. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, man. Say something good. Yes. In Jesus' name. Yes. Lord, we love you. Yes, we, we do. We bless you. We praise you. Yes. In Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. Gwendolyn, please. Please remain standing.
Blessed are the undefiled in the way, mm -hmm. who walk in the law of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, mm -hmm. who seek him mm -hmm. with the whole heart. Yeah. They also do no iniquity. Mm -hmm. They walk in his ways. Yeah. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Yes, Lord. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Then I would not be ashamed. When I look into all your commandments, mm. I will praise you yeah. with mm. uprightness of heart. Mm. Oh, yeah. When I learn your righteous judgments, mm. I will keep your statutes. Yes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. Mm. I have read for your consideration Psalm 119, yeah. verses 1 through 8. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I bid you greetings this wonderful evening. Um, and, uh, you know, I was uh, with uh, Gus and Nikki uh, the other night. Uh, we did an alumni banquet at Gray School of Theology. And uh, I was talking to them. And Nikki... Uh, proceeded to uh, talk about the lesson and she began to uh, identify some of the things that we had talked about and uh, it really blessed me that um, you know this was we, we had class on Wednesday and it was Friday and things were still fresh in her mind um, and so we want to uh, make sure that what we're um, what you are receiving, you're retaining. Let me say it that way. And so every week when you come, you'll have a handout so that you also can uh, be in reinforced with what I teach with the handout. And uh, I would encourage you to, uh, you know, take the handout and when you go home, just review it. Um, and if you, of course, have any questions, feel free to come in the following week. Just write those questions down and we certainly can chat about them. But I was, I really was, <laughs> I was really blessed to um, hear how much uh, Nikki had retained from uh, the class and, and how much she was saying, um, the, you know, the way that I put it, she had just not heard it in that, in that way that helped her remember. And so again, that's what we want. We don't want to just feed you with a bunch of information, but one, we want you to retain it, but we also want you to apply it as well as the Lord uh, shows you and directs you how to apply it, all right? So we've been talking about, uh, if we can, yeah, there you go. We've been talking about, and I guess I need to put this on, the um, Gospels, the Gospels. That's the books that we're focusing in on right now. And we said that the Gospels uh, are what we call these biographical books, biographical books. And it's, they're, uh, um, detailing or uh, giving uh, the information about Jesus's uh, mission, his ministry, and his personhood, all right? Uh, and we talked about those various aspects of uh, not only his person, but his platform, his power, his passion. We talked about all of those kinds of things uh, in order to get us to uh, this point. And so last week, we started talking about the book of Matthew in particular. Um, and so, and we also said that while uh, Matthew is uh, organized as the first book in your Bible, your New Testament Bible, uh, it's not the first scripture that was written in the New Testament. Typically, James is identified as the first book of the New Testament written. And there's some um, discussion whether or not Mark came before uh, Matthew and so forth and so on, which is not pertinent to our discussion tonight, but just so that you know there is some discussion about that. But just remember um, that your Bible, and you want to write down this phrase, is organized in thematic order. thematic order, all right? 
not in chronological order, not in the order in which the events took place or in the, the way in which they were written, but it's organized in thematic order. And that's just another way of saying uh, various themes or um, motifs, that's another synonym for it. So, you know, when you look at thematic, just think of themes or motifs, all right? Any, either one of those words equal this whole concept, as opposed to chronological order uh, by way of the calendar or when the events took place. So you need to understand that in order to uh, know that. Also, everything that Jesus did is not in your scripture, all right? In fact, when John writes at the end of, of John, he tells us if everything was written about Jesus, the world, and he's using hyperbole, obviously, but he, he says the world couldn't even contain all of the things that Jesus did, all right? So he's, he's hyperbole is, is, a, um, is a, an exaggeration of the truth. All right. So in other words, he's saying Jesus did a lot of stuff um, and uh, the world couldn't even contain it. It's so much stuff. And so but that's hyperbolic language. All right. It doesn't mean he, don't take that literally. I'll say it that way. All right. But he just what he's saying is there are a lot of things that Jesus did, but all of them are not captured in Scripture. OK, everybody with me so far? Yeah, that he didn't. He, all of these these four writers didn't capture everything that uh, Jesus uh, did. So now let's talk about this uh, whole calendar uh, idea, and you can see the very, and this will be in your handout, but the, the various ways to look at the Jewish uh, calendar. Uh, but when you think in terms of uh, Matthew's writing, Matthew is writing between the years of 50 to 60 uh, AD, which means that that was very that was in very close proximity to the resur to the death burial and resurrection and ascension of Jesus it's not that far after all of these events took place so i'm also saying at the same time that um, a lot of people that witnessed witnessed Jesus's event were still alive when Matthew was writing that's my point all right remember uh, Jesus um was crucified, uh, resurrected, and ascended about A.D. 33, all right, about that time. And so uh, we put uh, Matthew's um, writing between uh, the 50s and the 60s, okay? And so I'll tell you uh, some reasons why I say that, all right? So Matthew wrote about Jerusalem and the Sadducees, uh, and the Sadducees was a religious sect, Mary, um, and these guys, they didn't believe in the resurrection, and they didn't believe in um, uh, angels either. Uh, and so uh, he writes, uh, and so he includes these folk in his writings. And so, um, again, by the time, um, uh, so his, his, he's probably saying that they're in existence at this particular time, because later on, they did not exist. They went. They became a, a group that became extinct. Um, and so, also Matthew writes about Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He identifies it as the holy city. So again, Jerusalem was intact. Um, and so uh, he's writing before this whole event, Teresa of A.D. seventy. You guys got to remember this event. There are not a lot of dates that I'm going to give you. Not a lot of dates that you have to remember, but you need to remember, like, I already gave you one date. What date was that? You know? You remember? I just told you. I gave you one date, so you got to stay awake with me. What, what date was that? Anybody remember? That's right. Thank you very much. A.D. 33. All right? All right? That's when Jesus died. Remember, um, Jesus started his ministry at age, approximately age 30. And he had about a three to three and a half year ministry. So if you tack on three years to his age of 30, then it's around uh, A.D. 33 that he died. Here's another date that you should remember. A.D. 70. All right. And this is a very important event uh, when it comes to um, 
the Israelites. And I mentioned this to you uh, in past classes. You probably you may not have um, paid much attention to it, but I mentioned this in past classes. And the reason why I did is because this is when uh, Titus of Rome marched into Jerusalem and he killed a million plus Jews, a million plus Jews, destroyed the temple, sacrificed um, uh, unclean animal in the temple uh, and uh, killed, like I said, you know, killed, burned, pillaged uh, Jerusalem. All right. And so uh, so this is a very important date in the history of Israel. And here's the other thing that you got to take a look at is that um, in In Matthew 23, chapter 23, um, Jesus places a curse on that generation. When I say that generation, the generation that was living when he was living, all right, because they rejected him. And so he, he told them that if they did not uh, receive him, accept him, believe in him, then that generation would experience this curse. Now, you know, a typical generation lasts 40 years, all right? That's why the uh, children in the wilderness uh, marched around the wilderness for 40 years years so that and the reason why they marched around for 40 years was so that the younger generation would die off I mean I'm sorry the older generation would die off so that the younger generation would march into the promised land because God said that generation will not go into the promised land so the 40 years was a generation and they marched until that older generation died off so that now you know Joshua uh, and Caleb are ushering in the younger generation. In fact, the only people from uh, the previous generation that went into the promised land was Caleb and Jacob. I mean, Caleb and Joshua. All right. Moses didn't even get a chance to go. Can you believe that? Yeah. Right. So so uh, and then it's the younger generation that marched in because that was the 40 year uh, generation mark. OK, and so so watch this. So if, so Jesus, you know, let's just say. When Jesus starts his ministry, he's at A.D. 30. All right. And if you add 40 to to the A.D. 30. Then you come up with the 70. And so when when A.D. 70 happens, you know, most uh, folk are saying that. It's that curse that Jesus put on them back then that is taking place here, all right, on that same generation. But here's the here's reason why I tell you all of that. Um, none, of, none of the uh, New Testament writers, believe it or not, uh, wrote anything about it. None of them. N not, not one of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, none of them. They didn't say anything about uh, this. And so it begs the question that it probably occurred, um, the, the writing occurred probably before this event took place. All right? Now, uh, let's say, I put Greater St. Matthew up there on the screen. Let's say that you guys had a church event, and at the church event, Five million people got saved and joined Greater St. Matthew Baptist Church. Now, let me ask you something. Uh, how, many, how many of you guys have been here more than five years? Raise your hand if you've been here more than five years. Have you seen five million people join the church since you've been here? All right, how many of you guys have been here 10 years? Raise your hand if you've been here 10 years. Have you seen five million people at one time join the church? How many of you have been here 15 years? Oh, we got a good, good number. Praise the Lord. Uh, and have you seen 5 million people at one time join the church? How many of you have been 20 years? 
Have you seen? Oh, almost the same. Praise the Lord. Okay, so how many of you seen five million people at one time join the church? Nobody, right? Okay, so here's the thing. If five million people joined, and let's just say uh, Billy, they asked Billy to write about the history of the church, and five million people joined on that particular day, you think Billy is not going to write about five million people that joined that church? That would have to be one of the most significant events in the history of the church if five million people, I don't know of any church where five million people joined at one time. He would, it, he would, he would be, he, he would perform a, a spiritual malpractice if he didn't include it in his writing, right? Because that's the one, and so that's why we say that about these writers. One of the most significant things that happened in the history of Israel is this AD 70 event. More than one million Jews got killed. That's a lot of people. And, and you know, they talk about this as being the first Holocaust. That's what they say, <laughs> you know. The 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 um, um, the German when the when the German did their Holocaust, I think that was six million Jews. So so again, you know, we we argue, um, you know, not in a uh, antagonistic way, but we explain. I'll say it that way, that um, it stands a reason that he probably wrote before eighty seventy. That's my point. All right, because he didn't say anything about. Um, that major event. All right, the idea that this phrase, to this day, uh, Matthew would have uh, written this treatise after the crucifixion occurring approximately eighty thirty three, which is what we've talked about. And I tell you, I don't give you a lot of dates, but that's an important date, you know. And so the date range, like I said earlier, is between 50 and 60, uh, in the, between the 50 and I'll just say 69, A.D. That's probably the best way to say it. All right. Before. A.D. 70. That's the point. Question. Yes. Yes. That term that you talk about. Uh-huh. Did that also study uh, prohibit for all those Jews also? Say that one more time. No. Oh, no. Mm -mm. The curse was fulfilled. That was all. That was Hitler all by himself being led by. Um, Satan, yeah, no, um, yeah, it, it mm -mm. yeah, because remember, remember, I said that it was just on that generation, yeah, just that generation only. The place of composition, meaning where he wrote it, was probably uh, Palestine. Jerome, did you have a question? Okay, all right. The, the place of composition, um, uh, Palestine, and you know, some people's. Uh, speculate that it could have been in um, Syria, uh, but um, uh, you know, odds are he, you know, he lived in Palestine, uh, and so he ministered in Palestine. So he probably wrote it in Palestine. You can see the difference between uh, where Palestine is. Uh, we can get that back on the screen. Yeah, there you go. So you can see um, Syria of uh, Antioch way up there, as opposed to this screen will show you the difference between where Syria is and where Jerusalem is. Jerusalem is at the bottom of Syria is up there. Now, it's interesting, you know, when you go to Israel, you can actually see uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, you can see Syria from, um, you know, the border of Israel, because they border Israel. You re remember you have uh, basically Jordan immediately to the right, then you have uh, Syria, and then you have um, I think it's Lebanon, um, due north, all right? That's kind of how it is situated. Um, and so they're pretty much surrounded by enemies, with the exception of to the uh, west, which is uh, where water is. That's the Mediterranean Sea. But they're surrounded by uh, enemies. Some of the uniqueness of the book, it's a Jewish, um, primary, a Jewish book, Matthew is, that is, because it's a Jewish audience. And so he writes um, to the Jews in a way that uh, other people 
uh, wouldn't uh, right out of hand understand how he's putting these things together. He uses what we call parallelism poetry. Say parallelism. Now, whether you know it or not, you've studied parallelism if you've read through the Old Testament, all right? Lots of parallelism in uh, uh, Psalm, the book of Psalms, lots of parallelism in Proverbs. Um, and uh, it's just a type of Hebrew poetry. That's all it is. All right? It's a type of Hebrew poetry. So parallelism is what? Yeah, it's just a type of Hebrew poetry. And there, there's several flavors. I'm only going to give you the ones that we see quite a bit in Scripture. Um, the first one is synonymous parallelism. Say that. Yeah, and you see this all the time in Scripture. What happens is line one will introduce a concept, and then line two will either repeat it or restate it, all right? So when you read through the book of Psalms, you know, you can tell um, what the parallelism, parallelism is if, you know, it uh, gives you a subject in line one, and then it basically rephrases, restates, or repeats the same thing that he gave you in line one, all right? So that's, that just, that's what synonymous parallelism means, you know, just like, the, the, the typical word that we use, synonyms, all right? So it's basically saying the same thing, okay? The second one is what we call antithetical parallelism. Say antithetical parallelism. Yeah, and you could already hear it. Anti means against or opposite, right? And so antithetical, we use that word all the time, is it, it's a contrast. So you'll see... Uh, between line one and line two, you'll see words like but, yet, or. These are what we call um, conjunctions, and they contrast. So anything on this side will be different when you get on that side of these words, okay? So anytime you see any of these words in Scripture, your antennas ought to go up to say that, you know, whatever was over here, it'll be just the opposite over here. All right? And so that's what we call antithetical parallelism. The third one is what we call synonymous parallelism. I'm sorry, synthetic parallelism. Synthetic parallelism. And so synthetic parallelism is you'll see a, a statement on line one, and uh, line two will complete it or add on to it, okay? That's how you look at um, uh, synthetic parallelism. It will just keep going. And so you might see um, the words... You might see uh, and, to keep it going, you might see which... You might see that. These are all words that will keep the, uh, sentence, the second line going. Remember, it's poetry. So you got lines in poetry, all right? So, and then the third one is what we call comparative uh, parallelism. Say that. Yeah, in comparative parallelism, you look for the phrase, real simple, real simple. Look for the phrase, more than or better than. Those are the phrases that you look like. Because you are comparing what's over here to what's over there. That's what you're doing. Okay? You're just making a comparison between the two. All right? And so Matthew uses this. Yes, sir. <laughs> Is that... Uh... Is that like cross-reference? Uh, 
That's totally different. I, I, I can't hear you. Is that like cross-reference, you know, like uh, you pulling something, you matching up another scripture from like the oh, Old no. Testament? You, oh. Yeah, no, 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 no. You, you're talking more like correlation. That's what you're doing. Yeah, this is different, okay? This is, um, uh, if, if you have, let's just say, um, You have a uh, let's 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 just say uh, you have a scripture going along, and you, you have line. Well, let me do it this way, since it's poetry. Let me do it this way. So you have you have line one and line one. Well, let's just say. Um, For conversation, say God is good. Line two might say God is more than good. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, Jerome, you understand? All right, so this will be line one God is good. Line two would say God is more than good, all right? So you're looking for the, the phrase more than or better than. Those are the two phrases that you're looking at, all right? And so those are, those are the typical ones. So Matthew uses this type of, um, of poetry because he understands that his audience would understand that type of poetry, all right? Um, if I, let me, let me, let me see something. Hold on for a second. I'm going to see if I can, Do something real quickly. I don't typically do this, but I'm gonna do it. See if I can do it real quickly, so you can see real time. So this would be an example of um, synthetic parallelism. The Lord, this is Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is uh, my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Line 2 is going to basically say the same thing, just in different words. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So if you look at line 1 and you look at line 2, they're basically saying the same thing, just using different words. So that's what we would call synonymous parallelism. The, the two lines are synonymous, okay? So, and I don't want to get into this too much, but what happens is that these words that are used help to balance the scale between lines one and line, uh, and line two, sometimes even line three, depending on the situation. So parallel structure is really a matter of balancing syntax meaning how you put sentences together. And so, um, and so let me see if I can just run through a couple of more. Uh, yeah, so here, so you've seen one that's um, synonymous, so let me see if I can find one real quickly. That will be... Uh, yeah, so... When you get to uh, Psalm 1, verse 6, 
you see the contrast between the wicked and the righteous. And so you see the play off of that over and over and over again. So let's go to Psalm 20, uh, which is an antithetical, uh, antithetical parallelism. So yeah, so some boast in chariots and some boast in heart horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord. So what makes that antithetical? One word, what makes it antithetical? Yes, see, you got it already. That's just that simple. That's what makes it antithetical. And then this second verse, they have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. So that would be an antithetical parallelism, all right? This is, is all it is, okay? And so let me see if I can find another one for synthetic. Here's one for synthetic. Let me see. So, uh, so we're in Psalm 1, verse 3. He will be a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which, remember I put the word which up here, all right, uh, yields its fruit in its season. That makes it uh, synthetic, all right? It continues or it completes the verse. Here's another one. And its leaf, its leaf does not wither, and in whatever it does, uh, he prospers. So what are the three words that helps it move along to complete it? Three words. What are they? They're up there. Which is one, and what's the other two? And, exactly. Exactly. All right? And let me see if I can find a comparative, and then I'll get back to Matthew. So, so this is going to answer your question, Jerome, about the comparative, because you were really thinking about correlation as opposed to comparative. So here's one. This is Proverbs 15, verse 1. Uh, Sheho and Abaddon lie open uh, before the Lord. How much more uh, the hearts of men, all right? So the phrase there, much more, is, you know, the, the synonymous uh, or I should say the comparative phrase, how much more, all right? And so, um, and so that just gives the explanation of why it's comparative, uh, comparative parallelism, okay? So I think you guys got the idea. Um, here's another one, comparative. Uh, like a, a, trampled, a trampled spring and a, a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way before um, the wicked, all right? And so this is another one. It doesn't use uh, here in particular more than or better than, or I should say more than or, um, um, yeah, more than or better than, but uh, this is couched as one of those that are, uh, that is a uh, uh, comparative. Here's an, and these are some other comparative parallelism type poetry, all right? So, and, and notice all of these I'm using are coming out of the Old Testament, all right? So I just wanted to, uh, I didn't plan on doing that, but uh, just so that you guys can get a better understanding of parallelism poetry, what Matthew is using, all right? So let's go back to Matthew now. There you go. So um, other unique things in Matthew um, the phraseology, his theology, uh, he'll talk about the kingdom of heaven as opposed to the kingdom of God. Um, and so that's his primary uh, discussion. Remember, um, the uh, Jews didn't even like to mention the name God. Uh, so uh, you see that used more often. Identifying Jerusalem as the holy city, that's another uh, way of him talking to his Jewish audience. He gives Jewish customs, uh, that, and he doesn't explain what they are because he's assuming that since he's talking to Jews, they already know what he's talking about. Um, and then, of course, he quotes quite a bit from the Old Testament, quite a bit from the Old Testament. Um, he points uh, out the, the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus fulfilled. And I think uh, it might even be in your current handout I gave you a list of scriptures where Jesus has fulfilled Old Testament passages of scripture. And if you look at that list, most of them are in Matthew. Excuse me, a, a, a ton of them are, will be found in the book of Matthew where he has fulfilled. 
something that was um, prophesied in the Old Testament, all right? And then, of course, he uses Old Testament language like defiled or law, uh, Sabbath. These are all Old Testament words that Jews would be very, very uh, familiar with. Um, and the other thing is Jesus, when I look at, at Matthew, this is what I call the basic theme of Matthew. Remember, each one of the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are writing from a thematic or a, uh, a theme. They're writing from a theme, their vantage point. And I said last week, the best way to remember, who, who, who can remember the eyewitnesses of the four authors? You remember how I told you to, I, I told you the easiest way to figure it out. I said you got, you got Matthew, you got Mark, you got Luke, and you got John, right? And I told you there's an easy way to figure out who, who are the um, eyewitnesses and who are not the eyewitnesses. You guys forgot? Who said that? Okay. Yeah, Matthew and John, did, do you remember why it's easy to figure it out? Because they form bookends. They're bookends, all right? And they have, okay, all right. Okay, so y'all don't like bookends, all right? Think of it as a ham sandwich, all right? Uh, a BLT, all right? And they, this is the bread, all right? And Matthew, I mean, Mark and Luke is the, you know, lettuce, pickles, onions, you know, Sesame, you know, all beef, sesame, seeds, bun, what's the favorite sauce? Whatever, you know, all right? Uh, they're in the middle. I'm trying to get your attention some kind of way to get this out, all right? So don't think of it as bookends. Think of it as a sandwich. She's shaking her head back there. That's right, all right? Think of it as a sandwich or whatever your favorite dish is. There you go, two all beef, two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. That's what I was trying to get to. All right. So, but, but remember the two ends. Now, in, in, let me say this. In, when I was growing up, we had to eat the ends of the bread. And I used to hate it. I did. And uh, my brother would save me, though, because I got a big brother. He's seven, seven years older than me, and he didn't mind eating the ends. So when mama and daddy weren't, weren't looking, we swapped. And he liked the ends, Mike, he liked the ends because he would make, now, 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 now brace yourself, because some of y'all can't handle what I'm about to say, all right? So brace yourself. But he liked making a banana dog with the ends. See, y'all don't know nothing about banana dogs. Y'all, see, y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. My brother would go to town on a banana dog. And a banana dog is taking a banana and putting it inside of an end of a piece of bread and eating it just like it's a hot dog. It ain't a hot dog, it's a banana dog. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Y'all never had mustard sandwiches? Ketchup, okay, now you're coming into my world. She said ketchup sandwich. Is that any different than a mustard sandwich? <laughs> you know? All right. But that's how I got out of eating the ends of the bread because my big brother would save me because he didn't mind. And so when you think of this, think of my big brother eating them ends for me. And then you'll remember these two guys are eyewitnesses, percipient witnesses, we say in the legal field, percipient witnesses, meaning they were there and watched everything that was going on. So they're writing, so Matthew, he's saying, Jesus is Messiah, king of the Jews, king of the world. That's the, that's the theme that he's writing from, and it's this Messiah God sent to bring in God's kingdom, all right? And so what in the world do you think um, kings do? 
well, kings give speeches, all right? They give edicts, lots of words. And so when you look at Matthew, Matthew is focusing on the words of Jesus. And so if you notice, look how many words, 60% of his gospel uh, boils down to the words of Jesus. 60%. That's a lot. That's a lot. And you, you, you can even see um, 644 words in 1,071 verses. Because he is focusing on the words of Jesus. Mark focuses more on uh, the works of Jesus more than the words of Jesus because he's dealing with what we call um, Jesus is Messiah, but he's the servant of the Lord. And so he identifies what we call the suffering servant. All right. And so, so you know, um, this is what kings do. They give speeches. And Jesus gives, gave a lot of speeches in Matthew, a lot of his teachings in Matthew, and so we'll take you to what that looks like. And so these are the list of the major speeches in Matthew, the major ones. So first you have the Sermon on the Mount. That goes from chapter 7, I mean chapter 5 to chapter 7. What is that called? Sermon on the Mount. It starts out with the Beatitudes. It ends up with uh, the wise man and the foolish man, and one built the house on the rock, the other one built the house on the sand. All right? So it starts out that way, but it ends there. And the main issue in the Sermon on the Mount is righteousness. Is righteousness. That's why when you read 520, he talks about unless your righteousness exceeds these religious leaders, I'm paraphrasing, you know, okay? And so, again, the righteousness that we have to achieve is God the Father himself. Be ye perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect, all right? And so, uh, so, so that whole chapters 5 through 7 focus on righteousness, all right? Righteousness, practicing your righteousness. Um, the Sermon on Ministry, chapter 10, is, uh, for lack of a better word, Jesus gives the disciples a pep talk and then sends them out to first go to the house of, the, the, the house of uh, Israel, the lost sheep of Israel. Go to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. That's where he sends them, all right, in chapter 10. Then when you get to chapter 13, chapter 13 is the speech on the millennial kingdom. And what he's doing is because they have rejected him, he now gives all of these parables. So you see, when you read Matthew chapter 13, you see parable after parable after parable after parable. And I told you a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so this millennial kingdom is this 1,000 year um, rulership of Christ on earth, all right? 1,000 year rulership of Christ on earth. And so when you go to Revelation 19, all the way from 19 to 22, you see that. He ends um, all of the enemies in, in uh, 20, and then in 21, you know, you uh, begin to see the new heaven, new earth, and all of those kinds of things take place, all right? Uh, so that's the, that's the millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year reign right here on earth. Then, of course, um, in chapter 18, you have the Sermon on Humility and the Sermon on Forgiveness. The Sermon on Humility, the Sermon on Forgiveness. If you've got a problem with your brother or your sister, you take it to them. And uh, if they don't hear you, then you go get a witness. If they still don't hear you, you get two or three witnesses. If they still don't hear you, uh, then you take them to the church, all right? Didn't say lay hands on them, all right? Let me say that. You know, it didn't say curse them out. It said take them to the church, all right? Now, nowadays, you take somebody to the church, they just get up and go down to the street, to the church down the street, and forget about this church. That's kind of how, you know. I mean, I mean really, that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's almost, well, it's tough to do church discipline nowadays because, you know, 
Um, so many churches don't talk to one another, you know. So if you got a saint that gets mad here and goes down the street to another church, you know, odds are the same thing's going to happen down there. They're going to get mad about something because there is no perfect church, you know. So, uh, I mean, you know, some people need to move, all right. Um, but, but, but again, you know, ch churches don't talk to each other. So it's, anyway. Uh, so, so that's chapter 18. Then you have the sermon on the great command. I didn't say the great commission, but the great command. That's chapter 22. Uh, and that's where he says, basically, it boils down to the greatest, um, the greatest commandment is to love God, love people. All right? Love your neighbor as yourself. So, uh, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's uh, vertical and it's horizontal. That's basically what that scripture is talking about. Love God, love people, all right? Vertical and then horizontal, okay? And then 23 is what I talked about earlier. That's the curse on that generation. That's the cursed curse on that generation. Jesus basically said that I, I'm not coming back until Israel asks for me to come back. And they say, blessed uh, is he who comes in the name of the Lord, all right? Uh, and then 24, 25, we call that the Olivet Discourse. That's the Olivet Discourse. And it's all about end times. End times. So it's right, he's writing about his second coming. Not the rapture, but his second coming. He's writing about what will happen uh, right before uh, the um, end of times. He even talks about the tribulation in the Olivet Discourse. All right? Uh, and so that's chapters 24, 25. He'll talk about uh, the sheep and the goats at the very end of that in 25 um, to give you an example of, uh, you know, separating out who go goes into the kingdom and who does not. And then 28, the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and make disciples. All right? So these are the primary speeches, uh, teachings, preaching, if you will, that Matthew captures in his scriptures, okay? So remember, he's uh, writing about Jesus as king. So um, king of the Jews, king of the world, uh, and of course, uh, we'll talk about um, Jesus's fitness, if you will, for being called king of the Jews, king of the world. So remember um, that when you get to something very, uh, you know, unusual, I would say, is in Matthew, when he first starts to write, talking about Jesus as king of the Jews, king of the world, when Matthew first starts to write, he immediately connects Jesus with uh, David. Then he connects Jesus with Abraham. All right? Now, why, do, why, why does that look weird in the text? Anybody can tell me why that would seem weird? First, he connects him to David. Now, he's going, he's going to go down Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. But he, you know, and so when you think about somebody's genealogy, well, if I say that, I'll give it away. Well, so, but in here, he, he connects David with Jesus first, or Jesus with David first, then with Abraham. So why, why would that be unusual? Or, or let me ask a different question. Where was, uh, Pierre, you're about to say something? You want to tell me why that's unusual? Uh, it's unusual because, it was unusual because uh, David was after Abraham. Absolutely, absolutely. So chronologically, Abraham came first, all right? Abraham is in Genesis, all right? David comes much later. In fact, we see David like, you know, in 1 Samuel, all right? So, um, um, and of course, you know, he writes the book of Psalms, uh, 73 of the Psalms. So, um, so yeah, so I, I think that he connects David and Jesus together because of the 
the Davidic covenant, all right? The Davidic covenant, which is for, take one guess who you think the Davidic covenant is for. What, what nation do you think the Davidic covenant is for? Take one good guess. Come on, say it. Yeah, say it. Yeah, right. So the Jews, exactly. So I think that's why he connects them there first, because his audience is a Jewish audience. All right? So, and David was the, for lack of a better phrase, he was the standard for all kings. When you read through the historical sections, they will say something like, and I'm paraphrasing, but they'll say this, writers will say that, uh, and this particular king either walked or did not walk in his father David's footsteps. So if it said he did walk in his father David's footsteps, they're saying he's a good king. If he did not walk in his father David's footsteps, they're saying he's an evil king, all right? So David becomes the standard by which all of the kings are judged in Israel. And if you recall your Israel history, remember that at one time they were a united kingdom. That means they were just one big happy family under um, uh, Saul, David, and Solomon, right? They were just one big happy family, united, all right? But of course Solomon began to um, support these foreign wives who were uh, worshiping idol gods. And so God said, you know what? I don't like what you're doing, man. I'm paraphrasing, all right? Uh, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear this kingdom in half, but I'm not going to do it on your watch because of your father David, but I'm going to do it on your son's watch. So Solomon had a son by the name of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam comes along, and so this is united, right? This is, you know, it's all good. United Kingdom. Rehoboam comes along, and, um, and, and all of the people say, hey, man, you know, you need to lower the taxes, because we're getting taxation without representation. No, they didn't say that. But, uh, but that's what they were feeling like, all right? And so it said, Lord, the taxes. And so he goes to his father's wise men, Teresa, and they say, listen to the people. Now, remember, his father was known as the wisest man ever, right? So his father's wise men said, listen to the people. He doesn't listen to his father's wise men. He goes back to his homeboys. And he, he, Mary, he says, he says, hey, y'all, these folk want me to uh, lower the taxes. What you guys think? Well, his, his homeboys are saying, you know, look, real boy, we're living high on the hog. I mean, you know, we're living large. You know, we got the flow. We got the dough, you know. They got to go, you know. So, so, you know, he comes back. Watch this. He comes back and tells the people, I'm going to, you think my father gave you guys taxes? I'm going to really stick it to you. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. So he, so, so the people got mad. Watch this. People got mad. And you know how y'all folks are when you get mad. If the Bible didn't say that these were Jewish folks, I'd think they were black folks. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No. He, ten tribes go to the north. Ten go to the north. Two tribes, now you know, I already told you last week, there were 12 tribes, right? Remember, uh, Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons, one daughter. The 12 sons became the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes became the nation of Israel. So 10 of these tribes went to the north, and two tribes went to the south, uh, Judah and Benjamin went down here. All the rest of them went up here. These were called Israel. These were called Judah. All right? So this happened 
after Solomon. So now the nation is split. And now it's a divided nation, no longer united, right? And so, uh, so but again, all of these kings were evil, every single one of them, 100% evil. And they refused, even though Jerusalem was down here, they refused to bring the people to Jerusalem because you know why? They thought that if they got back down there, they would get uh, nostalgic, homesick, and want to get back together. So they, they built altars up here and kept them from coming down here. All right? And so, uh, but, and here you had some of them evil, some of them good kings down here to, in, in the south. All right? All evil, you had a mixture. And I don't, I don't even want to say 50-50. I'll just say... Uh, you had a mixture. 50-50 just represents a mixture of good and evil kings. Okay? And so, so he's connecting, Matthew is connecting this Jewish audience because they understand this Davidic covenant that impacts them. All right? Then he connects them to Abraham because Abraham is known as the father of many, and some people say many, nations. Because in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, he gets, he gets land, a promise, land, sea, and a blessing. All right? Promise land, promise seed, promise blessing. And this blessing, God says, and this seed, God says, is going to bless the entire nation, the entire nation's. Period. So he's identified, at, he's identified as the father of many nations. So Jesus is Messiah, king of the Jews, by way of the Davidic covenant that said that there's always going to be a son of David that sits on the throne. But he's also the king of the world through Abraham because Abraham is bringing Jesus Christ into the world. All right? So... Matthew is writing and saying, Jesus is the Messiah, he's the king of the Jews, but he also is our king as well, king of the world. Amen? All right, let's give the Lord a hand praise, come on. All right, any questions before I uh, let you guys go? Or anything I can clarify? Yes, sir. I guess it's a minor, a minor point, but I'm asking, why did they call it the Olivet Discourse? I'm, I'm, say that again? The Olivet Discourse. Oh, yeah. Why was it called? The reason why they call it the Olivet Discourse is because that's where it took place, on the Mount of Olives. All right? And remember, the Olive, Mount of Olives is very important in being connected with Jesus. Uh, one, because that's the place where he ascended. Two is the place that Zechariah says he's coming back, all right, Zechariah 14. So, you know, he's going to come back. I think I told you guys this. He comes back, and the mountain splits. He got one foot here on this mountain, the other one on this mountain, and the Israelites uh, are freed by running through the valley um, uh, when uh, the uh, battle of the nations take place at the end of the world. Yeah. So, and so it's just location, all right? They're, they're, this is happening. They go up on the Mount of Olives, and, and it's, um, uh, I think it's uh, the uh, inner circle plus Andrew, I believe. Um, but, but that's why it's called uh, the Olivet Discourse. Okay, good question. What else? Anything else? Yes, Jerome. I hope I won't get way off track, but how, how do that tie in when Paul say that he come back on the cloud? And that's for... Yeah. The new Christians today compared to the Jews in, yeah. in Jews. Yeah. And, and it's a very good point. Remember when I said um, I was talking about uh, uh, end times, I was talking about his second coming. There's a difference. That's a great question, Jerome, because people, people confuse the two. And so let me just. Oh, wait, do I? I think I even. Let me see. Hold on. Only for you, Jerome. Only for you. Hold on. Let me see some. Let me see some. 
real quickly. Okay, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but um, so let me let me do this like real quick. So uh, if you can see, Jesus is hanging on the cross. Okay, so uh, and that jumps off the church age. You know, that's where we are right now in the church age, where it's a period. It's called the church age. It's called the dispensation of grace. It's called uh, the period of delay. And this is where God is allowing people to come into his kingdom and be a part of his family. That's why it's so important, the great commission, that we go out and evangelize people and make disciples, all right? And so then the next thing where you see all those, all those arrows going up, that's the rapture, okay? That's different, okay, than when Jesus comes back, the second coming, all right? So that's the rapture. When Jesus comes, he comes, but he never touches on the earth. So they don't call it the second coming. We are caught up to meet him in the air. And so that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 to 18, okay? So, so you, so you got to understand the difference between the rapture and the second coming, two different events. So watch this. So... Uh, then, so these are some events that will start to take place. There will be a signing of the covenant, and this is what we call end times, the last days, last things. And then uh, after the covenant is signed between Israel and the Antichrist, um, then that will trigger the tribulation period, and it will be seven years, and it's divided into three and a half, three and a half, all right? Uh, and so Matthew will talk about that as a part of the Olivet Discourse. See in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 8, the beginning of sorrows. Then um, in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist will be revealed. He will re reveal himself um, and stop all sacrifices. You just got to worship him. And then the second half of the tribulation will come. And so again, Matthew is describing that. And so... The second half is this last three and a half years. So the first three and a half years is what we call the tribulation. The second three and a half years we call the great tribulation. And that just means that there's more death, more bloodshed, more gory stuff that takes place. Um, and then, um, you, you know, you, during that time you have the uh, sealed judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bold judgments. Then uh, at the end of that period, that's his second coming that you were describing. Okay, so you can see the rapture is way over here. The second coming is way over there. And then, of course, um, you have uh, the saints will be uh, go before the judgment seat of Christ in between the rapture and his second coming. We actually come back with Christ. We don't go through the tribulation, by the way. Let me say that again. We don't go through the tribulation. All right. Let me say that again. We don't go through the truth. We don't go through the tribulation, all right? That's what the rapture is all about. So you don't have to go through the tribulation, all right? That's why I keep telling y'all, talk to your neighbors, talk to your family and friends, all right? Uh, and so we come back with him. That's chapter 19 and 20. Uh, 20, he throws, 19, I should say, he throws the false prophet and the, um, uh, the, the beast into the lake of fire. In 20, he throws... The, uh, Satan into the lake of fire as well as all of the sinners that rejected him, the people that didn't trust him as Savior. And then he'll, he, before he throws the sinners into the lake of fire, he puts them at the great white throne. That's that GWT where, and they are judged and then all of them find this way in the lake of fire. And then we go on to the eternal state, which is way over there. And we live with, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit throughout all eternity. All right. So I did that just so you can see that there's two different events. One is a rapture 
before the tribulation. His second coming is at the end of the tribulation. All right? Good question, though. Good, great, great question. And so you can see Matthew writes about that. And that's in the, the Olivet Discourse, Pierre, that you were asking about. It's in the Olivet Discourse. All right? Good question. All right, any other questions before we go? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for this. Come on. Ah, let's see. Basil, why don't you close us out in prayer, please, sir? Father, we are truly, truly grateful to you for this privilege of being able to sit under your word and examine it, study it, that we might come to know you in a true and intimate way, and that we may come to know what it is you have called us to. As we study, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us. Yes. I pray, God, that as we wrestle to understand the heart of scriptures, yes. that you would give us illumination, hmm. strengthen our minds, you, strengthen Jesus. our understanding. Thank you, Lord. And Father, when we come to those passages that we have been believing one way about, hmm. and truth has been revealed, yes. We ask that you would give us the courage Thank you, Lord. to abandon our own ideology mm. and embrace the truth of the text. Yes, Lord. Thank you for the commitment of Dean Mark Haywood. Thank you, Lord. In training your people in the scriptures that they might know you, the only true God. Yes. And Jesus Christ, whom mm. you have sent. That's right. Thank you for our senior pastor, Ronald Eugene Booker. Yes, yes. We ask that you will continue to heal him. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you will continue to strengthen his body yes. and restore his health to him. Please, Lord. Thank you for his willingness to provide such a venue for your people to come together. Yes. Whether in person or online. Yes. So that we can study the truth of your word. That's right. And then, God, will you bless your people, those that come week after week, mm -hmm. in person and online. Will you bless us? Yes. Will you help us to not only be hearers of the word, mm -hmm. but doers of the word? Yes. Grant us traveling grace as we go back to our various destinations. Yes. And let us find our f home and our family well. It's in Christ's name we pray. Hmm. Amen. 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 Good night, everybody. See you next week. Hey, Gwendolyn. How are you?